Um, so first, uh, who am I? Uh, I'm an uh, orthopedic uh, consultant. So uh, half of my time I cut people up yeah. and get paid for it. That's my job, and fix bones. Um, then I'm, uh, the other half I'm uh, doing a postdoc uh, where I use, use uh, AI to interpret uh, orthopedic medical images. And um, that has kind of naturally gone into building a company in order to, when I, when I did my PhD, I wrote an excellent thesis that no one read and no one would ever use. So my immediate reaction was that this, I, I'm not doing this ever again. But I like this stuff. So I figured that this technology allows us to actually communicate important information to doctors and this uh, was a pretty good match. Uh, I'll tell you a little about it later. My plan to talk about it, what we're going to talk about is a little more medical pain points. There's a lot of, I found misconceptions what we doctors do and what, what is annoying and what our actual problems are. Uh, I'll talk a little about the deep bed um, and then I'll, I figured that interesting to know a little about the regulatory uh, parts of uh, uh, AI and uh, healthcare. Uh, so we'll go a little, a little into that. And then kind of little quick tips if you want to get into this field, how to deal with IT departments and like what I learned. Um, so to start with, with uh, when, when you think of medicine and surgery, you have like, we're going to bomb this with surgical precision. Like that's like super surgical. Like when you do surgery, you realize there's no, no such thing as surgical precision. It's kind of like, most of the time it actually works out for some wonderful reason we don't quite understand. Um, <laughs> it's, it's perceived as really difficult, like really tricky. You, uh, you look at some of the TV series like Howl's and you're like, this is really mind-numbing. Uh, and a lot of people like, tired. there's a lot of chronic diseases out there, like most of us will be chronic, so that's, that's a common conception that people have, and we're, we're looking for treatments. Now reality, as I told you, it is, it is somewhat, it, it, there is a precision in, in there, but there's also mixed in with a lot of crudeness. Uh, now, it is difficult, but it's not difficult for the reasons you see in the TV series. The, the difficulty is completely different from what you would think. Like, often you have, like, the most common problem I have is that I have disease A and disease B in the same patient, and the treatment for them are the exact opposite. It, it, it's the, and there's no, like, we doctors, when we find a textbook example, we're going to go like, oh, did you see that? Did you see that? It's like a test textbook. It's crazy, but it's really like that. There's, there's so few patients that actually match the textbook. Like genetic disease, you know, perfect. Like the really clean stuff have one gene that's, that's failing, but that's rarely the case. It's really rarely the case. Um, and most of the time we're, we're more into managing. Now I'm an orthopedic surgeon, so I have to treat patients, but, but a lot of medical care is about uh, managing. So when, when you think about AI and what to do, so you need to know a little about medical outcomes, what, is, what, we, what do we care about? What is important for us? What has medicine learned over these years? So the traditional outcome is of course death. Uh, we, we don't want that. Uh, we're, we're actually still at 100% mortality, last time I checked. Uh, although there are people in Silicon Valley that are actually working on this for real, I've heard. It, it may be a problem. And the problem with death that you, that you may not be aware of, or if you haven't thought about it, is that you're basically just adjusting the time until death. 
And most people that die, die at a very old age. So the signal you get in your models due to death is extremely weak because it's such a rare outcome. You basically never find it. Fortunately, of course. Um, so another common thing is like, do you develop a cardiac infarction? Like you, some kind of disease outcome. Uh, you mes measure what type of food you eat, and then, then you see the kind of disease. And this is, I mean, in, in deep learning uh, situations, you would just like increase, change the type of food to like have an app that photographs your food, and you get the chance of <laughs> disease. The problem with disease is it's not like disease is a binary. Like you, you think of disease as a binary thing. Like you have diabetes or you don't have diabetes. Super obvious. Yeah, but then there's like all these kind of intermediate and yeah, there's some diabetes. But it's like, so, so there are obvious cases, of course, but there's a lot of in this gray area. Uh, so so it's, it's a difficult outcome to work with because of that, you you have don't have that much to really say about it, and, and it can be like if you go into psychiatric diseases, then then it's just a bunch of criteria, and you don't even know if the criteria is right. There's no real ground truth to it, and they keep changing these. So over time, if you if you start working with medical databases, you find that oh, there's a time factor to the disease. And, and there's some jumps there because suddenly they change their criteria and everything changes. Um, surgery is a common outcome that we said, like we, we do, uh, my, my thesis was on hip implants. You exchange the hip, the patient is fine, and then 10, 20 years down the line, you may have to redo the hip because all materials fail, it's, it's bound to happen. And the time, we want to make sure that the timeline there is as long as possible. The problem you have there is that the decision for surgery is affected by so much else that you don't really have control over. Like when you look at hip surgery, for instance, you see that uh, a lot of university clinics are performing poorer than private clinics. And you wonder like why why do these like, doctors in, in the universities do so poorly? Why don't they know how to operate? It's generally, by the way, the same doctors in both places. So, so, so it's uh, rarely the case that you have one group of doctors and the other group. They're both trained in the same place, and, and there's some switching in between. But the thing is that if you're in a university hospital, you're pretty you, you do a lot of revision surgery. You do a lot of reoperations. It's kind of the daily practice. Like you have a lot of these patients. If you're not in a university hospital, you ne barely ever do that. And and the bar for reoperating someone becomes much harder, higher. Or if the patient is really ill, has some other medical condition, you won't want to reoperate them. You need to factor that in when you're building your prediction models. If you want to really predict what, how the patient is doing. So like in the uh, 2000s, this major breakthrough uh, came, uh, was at least considered one, uh, according to nature, is that like patient reported outcomes. We're not going to let the doctors decide if they're sick or not, or if they need surgery or not. We're just going to ask the patients how they're doing. We're just, just going to send out forms. The problem you have there is that which form do I send? Like, what, what is a good form? What, what? And some of them have like 30 questions. Like, barely anyone wants to answer these forms anymore. Everyone is tired of answering these forms. So you have a lot of loss to follow up. And here's a, a very common one that I've done some research about. So you have the EQ5D, this one. This has five dimensions and three alternatives in each. So you see 
quite, there's a big jump between these different categories. It's really, really crude. And in the end, you work with this really weird score where one is supposed to be quite su super healthy. This is uh, 0.34 above death. <laughs> and, and, and it's like, uh, and, and the English version is even worse because you can go below, below that. <laughs> Which is like super confusing. And there's some, like, there's not everyone is it, there are the different ways to uh, put weights on these different uh, questions and try to get some agreement. But it's, a, it's an interesting model. I, I, I still, there's some problems there, and, and we don't always know if we're measuring the right thing. In orthopedics, for instance, like quite commonly, after a year, you most likely have adapted to whatever disability you're left with, and then it doesn't show up in these scores. So it's a little tricky, but it's a, it's a pretty good tool that uh, you may want to look at when you're in uh, healthcare and doing uh, AI. Uh, there's also sick leave. It's also another interesting. So I've seen some, uh, these, all of these aren't always like, there's no, there's no right or wrong in these. They're not always well aligned. So there's no like, there's not always a clear answer. This is what we should choose because all of these will be good. Like all of these outcomes will be fine. Like for instance, uh, finger fractures in Turkey, they argue that we should operate in order to get people earlier back to work. But if you look at the risk of having serious complications and re-operations, then you wonder why is two weeks really worth having 2% increase in infections and re-operations? It's, it's a really hard question, and no one really knows the answer to this. Um, so, so, but when you when you're in this field, you kind of need to be aware of the entire spectrum of outcomes. That it's not only one thing that you're looking at. Um, now, another thing that you find out pretty quickly when you work in healthcare is that regression to the mean is my best friend. How many here are familiar with regression to the mean? What it is? Yeah, so whenever you go to the doctor, you're not feeling great by definition. Like you generally seek out the doctor because you feel that there's something wrong with me. I have an ache here and an ache there. If you imagine that there's some fluctuation in your general well-being, you're generally going to go when you're at the lower bound of that fluctuation. That's going to be your uh, time to go to the doctor. And if I only, no matter what I give you, you will always become better because you will regress to your mean. <laughs> I can give you whatever I want. <laughs> and this is a huge problem. This is, not, this is not a trivial issue. We've done a lot of crazy surgery because of regression to the mean. We've done a lot of crazy treatments because of regression to the mean. You need to be aware of this. And if you're doing AI, and you're not aware of this, and you don't have experimental data to work where you actually randomize, you're going to be seeing this. And uh, like, so, so this, it's really, really important to understand. And, and uh, so then, like, if you look at the difficulty, I kind of estimated the uh, the cases in, in general like medical practice, I would say that 45%, 50%, yeah, pretty obvious. Like, super easy diagnostics. Um, or actually not even obvious, they're basically regression to the mean problems. Like there's nothing wrong with the patient. You may put some stamp on it, but there's nothing really wrong with the patient. They will become better if you only have allow it to, the time to move on. Then there's a lot of like, yeah, of course, yeah, it's, it's a fracture. It's 
doesn't take me that long to look at an image and decide that this is a fracture. And then there's like, this is the kind of conflicting where you have, yeah, you have a really bad fracture according to the textbook, you should operate on this, but the patient is so sick and so heart disease burden that if you do surgery, you have a huge risk of infection and they may actually die within a short time after. So what do you do? What, what is like, and, and this is really hard to know. Like there's, sometimes you have like a patient with, with you, you know that this needs to have surgery. It's not really acute, but it's kind of, they would benefit tremendously from it, but they have dementia. So they can't say okay. What do you do? The patient is obviously in pain, but they, they can't be okay. And it's really hard. You like going in and doing surgery on someone that doesn't agree to it, that doesn't understand, that may you may think you're doing well, but you may not really be doing well. Uh, like a lot of our, I think, fifty percent of our wards are demented people. Like there's and, and GDPR. For those of you who don't know it, doesn't allow us to do research on dementia. It forbids it because they can't give consent. I hope they they solve it. It's it's amazing, but it's true. Um, so that's kind of like where we are. And then there's this five percent, which is really interesting, of course. Um, and so if you if you want to get into medical healthcare, you need to find some way of reaching through to the clinicians. There's no shortage of predictive models in healthcare. I, I know a ton of different scores that I can use on my patients. There are plenty of sites where I can like put in the symptoms and get kind of diagnostic information. It's just not usable. It just doesn't get where I am, they they don't the, the channels are are wrong. Like if I need to spend five ten minutes putting in symptoms and then it gives me back that yeah this is just a normal case this will be fine don't worry about it. It's a little hard to motivate the next time. Um, so so the, the receptiveness for different things may be different in different specialties. Some specialties are more burdened with predictive model, like if you look at, at oncology for instance, they have a lot of predictions. Uh, so I may think that if you want to go in with a predictive model in oncology, you have, uh, that's cancer for those of you that don't know. Um, it may be a little more tricky. Uh, so, and you have to kind of align the incentives so you are solving the actual problems that we have, like what is what is the clinician's problem, and try to solve that. The too many solutions that I've seen, of, I haven't been, I've been in healthcare for 20 years now, but during this short period, there's so many solutions that don't really solve any of our problems. It's like rarely we have a, a tool that actually helps us. So there's really a lot to do there, but you need to be willing to talk to the clinicians and try to figure out what the issues are. How do we get to them? How do we design a tool that is integrated into their environment? Um, so that's why I started this thing, 2016. Um, and, uh, well, we have one paper up so far. It's been like getting the data took us one year. Everyone was super positive, still took us one year to get the data. I talked to uh, some researchers at KI that wants some other data, and they've been at it for two or three years, I think, where all the clearances, everything is done and, and still just doesn't happen. Really takes time. Um, the first time we ran the model, we tested. Uh, my my uh, collaborated with 
in a KTH then. Now we have one of their deep learning experts with us. Uh, he ran some uh, models and concluded, that, yeah, this doesn't work. Uh, try some other, other kind of, and it, it wasn't that the, there wasn't anything wrong with the deep learning model. It was just the crap that I put in there, like the answers, the the information that we use due to the size of the data set. We have to rely on the radiologist report a lot. And, and the, the messiness of, of this is astonishing, like just amazing how blurry stuff becomes. Like we, we Jakob here, who's my PhD student, tried a ton of like machine learning models to, to analyze and get classes and stuff. It just doesn't work. Just, we're doing regex now. <laughs> <laughs> it works perfect, but you have to know a lot of like stuff around it that just. Um, and, and you have to still you know, correct a lot. So, so once, once we did a lot of regex and, and cleaned the data set, it, it worked much better. So we got much better results and, and we were able to finally publish the paper. Um, now for like an orthopedic surgeon, it's super interesting because we have this, tool. we're always, we don't look at the radiologist report, we're immediately looking at the images and, and reading them on our own. So having an image viewer is kind of a natural channel to surgeons. Uh, so that is uh, kind of what we're working on here. You have uh, our prototype uh, and uh, we're hoping to get that into the hospital under the during, yeah, hopefully before September. Uh, but I was hoping we would be up around by now, but I haven't heard back from SLLIT. <laughs> um, so yeah, yeah, I contacted them in January. <laughs> um, I filled out the form though, I, 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 the form is done. Um, so so when, when you go into this, you have also the CE mark. And one, th one thing you would be astonished about is the software that we use in healthcare. It's really something from the medieval ages. Uh, and it's kind of, there's a lot of regulations around this, and, and this kind of makes it slow to progress. Uh, and they made it a little more tricky. There's this new regulations, 175 pages long, um, that came in 2017, and, and 2020 you have to follow this. Uh, and if you're uh, into AI uh, or deep learning or whatever, you realize this is the paragraph you're interested in. So software intended to provide information. This doesn't say anything about any predictive model, anything. You could just draw a line somewhere and that you would be able to uh, view that as information. Uh, that is, could take diagnosis or therapeutic purposes this is really why I have like I don't know if anything does not fall into this category <laughs> uh, then it's a 2a class now if you have like anything that can cause surgery uh, you go into class 2b which is kind of like a lot of stuff in medicine may end up in surgery so so you, you almost inevitably end up here. Um, now there's several annexes to uh, the classification that uh, these apply, so there's the, this, these three. Um, uh, there's a notified body that is supposed to check that you conform to uh, these uh, three annexes. And these are actually not that long, so even though the document is pretty long, they're, they're pretty readable, and it's, it's, it's not that bad as, as it may look at first. So the first one is about risk management, uh, error handling, of course information security. Uh, there's a lot of, like, for some reason, people believe that healthcare information is super important and interesting. If you look, read charts, you realize there's a lot of boring stuff in there. <laughs> it's not really that exciting to read. Uh, uh, but but it's the, the security uh, requirements are pretty high. 
so you, you basically have to do some kind of national security stuff to be higher than than healthcare. Um, the verification validation, of course. Uh, then uh, the second uh, is a little more detailed. Uh, so you have to specify whatever you're you're treating, who you're treating. Uh, the manual, of course, has to be there. Anything new, you have to document. If you if you're creating change, some changes, you have to explain them and, and send them in for uh, check. Um, there's a benefit risk analysis. A lot of about risk management and how to deal with this, how to constantly evaluate risk. Uh, so uh, then. Um, here they specify a little more about the actual tests and validations. Uh, you have to be also specify hardware, of course. In, in our case, it's GPUs and, and such. And then the last part is that once you build this thing, you can never let it go. You're kind of, if you're a class two, you have to every year do a post-market surveillance and report to the notified body. Uh, so you have to have uh, constant uh, control over serious incidents, uh, non-serious incidents, if these start to increase, you also have to start reporting. Uh, you have to have a of course, bug report, you have to see if other players are having issues. Uh, uh, and there's a lot of things that go into this. Um, so that, that was it about uh, CE marking that one to kind of give you a feel for what, what it is about. Now when you approach healthcare systems and, and, and try to do something in healthcare, you have to realize that it's a pretty monolithic system. Everything is built into one big piece, which is why they have I mean I sympathize with these guys because, because I would never like you start changing one part of it and then you have no idea what else will be affected by this tiny change over here. Uh, so it, it, there's, there's a really a kind of risk aversion thinking like it's, it's working and what they're mostly interested about if you if you look at the news whenever the healthcare systems are down it makes big headlines so having high uptime never any downtime is really important in these scenarios. Uh, and that is why like when you contact these people, you have to understand that this is their priority. They, they need to make sure that there's a good uptime. They can't allow, if they allow an AI system and all of a sudden you start like, pushing calls to the, all the APIs all over and crash the entire network, they're they'll be pissed at you, but they'll be responsible for it as well. So, so you have to make sure that uh, they're comfortable with this. Um, so when you contact them, make sure you get a number. It's like exactly like when the Swedish model, you get a number, right? The, the, the data that we, like, have, I think about three or four months in, we realized, oh, we didn't have an e-health number. Okay, then, then we got one that things started to progress a little quicker because we could have the, this uh, kind of uh, bug report system for, for these things. Uh, then try to have a person that you can contact also. That's really know who's responsible for your case. Uh, they have a lot to do. They're generally pretty spread out of the different things, so, so make sure you have someone that you can talk to. And plan ahead, like, may, don't think this will happen. This is not like starting up a new web server. That takes 20 minutes at the most. This takes months before it's up and running. So, yeah. That's why I wanted to talk about. Um, we're running out of time a little bit, but maybe we have time for some short questions. Uh oh, some us over there. <laughs> maybe you can repeat the question. Uh, maybe I can speak like this. 
So uh, actually, we, I think we've emailed before. Uh, so I, I'm in Landstinget, I'm in Makosbeningen. Uh, so I'm, I'm sort of dealing with some issues relating to, to uh, information and, and future of, of uh, Landstinget. And, and I think one thing that I'm always uh, trying to figure out is how uh, we sh we've got to get access to, to data for, for, for building in models and stuff like that. And I don't have a good answer. I was asking you, how do you think about that? A pretty good easy way. Uh, so the question is, uh, how do you get access to medical data? Yeah. You do research. Yeah, there's a research framework for that. Yeah. It's pretty well defined. You write the ethical application, uh, make sure you contact the right people, and, and then you get the data. Uh, that is not, it takes some time, and it depends a little on what you want to do. The more people you start contacting, the slower it will become, because each each owner of the data has to be okay with giving you the data. They have to verify that your ethical application is correct, uh, that there is nothing that you've missed in the ethical application. The ethical application is not a guarantee for you to receive data. You have to remember, it's the actual part that is giving you the data that is responsible for making sure that, yeah, they, they've looked at this, but is this actually correct? Uh, and then they can give you get the data. And I, don't, I would say that in general, try to partner with some researchers that know the field, because you will quickly realize that data is great, but data without knowing the outcomes and the entire complexity of this part that I was talking about is really useless. So you, you need to have some kind of understanding. It takes a while of clinical work before you get that uh, understanding. Yeah. I uh, you talk you talked a lot about a bunch of the, uh, these obstacles to actually getting something in and used by a clinician. I, I remember in another workshop on precision medicine, there was like a, a pyramid, and although hundreds of papers have been published, almost nothing made its way into actual practice. Can you give any examples of, maybe like success stories, examples of anything that has made its way into practice? I think medical imaging is actually a real success story where we can do 3D reconstruction, uh, we can do a lot of things there. We, can, uh, we plan a hip surgery, we can click on the image and it automatically positions all the components and uh, really works smoothly. Uh, if you look at ECGs, for instance, uh, like of course, if you talk to a cardiolog cardiologist, they will tell you, that you can never trust a machine. Like, it's just crap. <laughs> I always trust the machine. Like, <laughs> I would never do. Like, uh, if it's uh, something wrong, then I run to a cardiologist. Like, this <laughs> should this? But but it's generally pretty solid. I mean, the, the, and that works really well. And uh, the, the quite a few cardiologists that I know that also said that today's measurements are pretty good. But then there's a problem, of course, that yeah, an ECG doesn't mean that much if you don't see the patient. There's only one signal. You have to have the other stuff as well. So, yeah. It talks a bit about um, some different outcomes and evaluating outcomes, uh, specifically that. So you said that, like for example, death is a is a potential outcome, but has very low signal because hopefully it doesn't happen that much. Along the same lines, there you talked about uh, conflicting times when it might look good to operate, but there's something, some other reason maybe that you don't operate. A lot of those may not make it into the medical records or. Maybe it's just a really bad decision, so no one does it anymore. From an AI perspective, what are your ideas in dealing with that or discovering those sort of really bad ideas that you'll have no training data for, basically? Um, well, if you, like, you, you have to try to find good sources of data. And you, I think like, what people will start realizing more and more is that you need a wet lab. You need to act, you can only go so far with a model. Like you have to be prepared to go into and, and ask the question. Like, if, if I try to figure out which type of surgery based on the data I have, I will 
get a huge bias because I, I get the surgeon's preference, not the actual best surgical option for that patient. Mm -hmm. uh, which I, I can get around that by choosing a different hospital which has different surgeons doing different, slightly different than I can like. But there's always going to be difficulty in going the, the full way unless you start doing randomized clinical trials. Okay, um, yeah, maybe time for a short question, and then it's time for a break. Um, and you talked about the difficulty with um, the, um, the forms and asking the questions correctly. Uh, have you found that you need to ask differently uh, if it's to build a data set or if it's to be read by uh, doctors? The, the forms that we have are basically always used in research uh, or in the registries. Uh, so they're, they're not really made for doctors to read. Uh, like I would, one thing that I would like to say is be cautious about the healthcare record because it really contains a lot of gaps of stuff that isn't there, that should be there, and, and misinformation. It's basically a notebook for doctors that there's no ground truth there. Okay, thank you so much. That was great. Mm -hmm.